So this is a work in progress of mine that I am going to be presenting as an actual academic ish paper at the Women's Studies Association Conference in Milwaukee in a few months. But it's also, I kind of want to give you something that's more like a book at, uh, at a certain point, but who knows when that will be. Um, the point of this is uh, to look at contemporary digital publishing from the standpoint of political economy. Shout out to my dad, um, rest in peace. He, this title was his, I just decided to use it for something else. Um, it is inspired in part by uh, Latoya Peterson, who's the managing editor of Racial Issues, which is this fantastic blog about race and pop culture, um, did a Twitter rant turned blog post in early 2014 about why there isn't a hairpin type of uh, major digital publication that's focused on women of color or people of color. Um, and I'll get more to what she says a little bit later. Um, but it's also in part inspired by my own life in writing and journalism. I've been blogging for the past 15 years. I've written for free, for pay, or for very little money for dozens of online publications by people of color, by marginalized people, um, most of which have gone under or gone out of business. Um, I've run my own blog for the past uh, eight years that has uh, other writers that write for free, and it kills me um, because I want to pay my writers. Um, and the struggle to secure money and to get funding to pay my writers is really difficult, and to monetize, and the decision to monetize, and how to earn an income is really difficult. Um, and it also really bugged me that websites like uh, Racialicious, um, some of the, the earlier websites that did a lot of really important writing um, on race and culture and difference and LGBT issues, uh, a lot of the earlier websites um, still struggle and plug along as nonprofits while other websites manage to get multi-million dollar budgets and tons of funding um, doing a, a the barest thread, a shadow of the work that websites like Racial Issues have done for years. Um, so why is this important? In the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, digital was really seen as this equalizer. This, uh, a lot of tech utopianists looked at digital as this way to create opportunities for marginalized people. Uh, it transcends race, gender. Um, and now there's this new fascination with underrepresented groups online, with Black Twitter, we have the um, the LA Times Black Twitter reporter who's supposed to, you know, be uh, a translating the world of Black Twitter to 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 the masses. Um, but I see it as uh, something more sinister than that. There's to me a convergence between digital media um, and traditional media that I think really exacerbates the economic divide. Um, along race, gender, and class lines um, when it comes to the industry of digital media. And for an example, I use BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed is currently valued at $850 million. Then you have, or Bustle. Um, Bustle got $27 million in funding. This is a guy, some uh, tech guy decided that the new vertical could make money off of women, because women actually read. Um, so he decided to do a website called Bustle, even though there are other websites that have existed for decades. Bitch, Bus, you can go down the list of uh, nonprofit, uh, grassroots oriented websites that have been doing a lot of the same type of writing for decades, but Bustle shows up out of nowhere. This guy gets $20 million, $27 million to even fund it. He actually got more than that, and it fell through with him. Three more rounds of funding, he ended up getting $27 million again. Um, so you have this on one end. On the other hand, then you have the threadbare economics of personal brand blogging, um, where 14% of bloggers actually earn a salary through their blogging. Um, and this was from a 2013 study by a place called Velocity Media. Um, and that same study said that most bloggers who actually do earn an income earn $24,000 a year. So that's you know, the barest minimum of what uh, a BuzzFeed could be doing. I'm sure even the lowest paid people at BuzzFeed don't get paid. Um, so back to Latoya Peterson. Um, when Latoya Peterson on Racial Issues um, did a string of tweets uh, early last year talking about, I guess somebody had asked her the question, why is there a hairpin for women of color? And she talked about the struggles that she went through in attempting to secure money for Racial Issues and how at the time when she tried to get um, funding for it, people were telling her that race was just not something that was scalable, that no one, you know, it was not going to 
to be something that was fundable and, and to be able to build into uh, a vertical that would be profitable enough for um, advertisers to be interested in. Um, one of the quotes that she said, or there was this, um, I definitely recommend you actually go to the website. All you have to do is look up uh, hairpin women of color and you can actually look at the entire blog post because she really gets a whole lot of people. Um, but one of the quotes that she said was, big ad dollars go to big platforms. Um, VC funding tends to go to known quantities or to big names or those who are already connected. Um, for example, Bustle, which I mentioned already. Um, websites from large media companies that pay writers, mostly women, people of color, LGBT people, pay minuscule amounts of money for people who basically mine their own personal trauma to bring in page views for these companies. So for example, there's this new, Kirsten Media has a new company called The Mix, where they're basically paying people like $50 to $100 to write on topics like these are actual topics. How my serious illness changed my sex life. I didn't immediately love my baby. I made a huge mistake on social media. Um, and a lot more traumatizing topics that I think are moving to triggering uh, content. And they're paying a minuscule amount of money for people to basically find their, their deepest traumas to basically bring in page views for a large group of people. Um, as I said before, most of the people who are writing this tend to be women, they tend to be people of color, they tend to be people who are already marginalized within media. They're usually not staff writers, and they're usually getting paid very little money. It's a model that is adopted not just by digital, uh, new media, digital companies, but has been adopted by legacy media companies as well, like Washington Post, like The Guardian, and like the aforementioned Hearst. So for me, this is all kind of selfish because I've been writing for 15 years. I have so many underemployed, person of color, marginalized person friends who have been working in blogging and journalism and media who, you know, will write those $50 to $100 pieces because you want to get that byline and it's important to get work. Um, but what was the point in working so hard if a tiny handful of people of difference get to break into the industry and an even tinier handful have the ability to move that needle. But some random white guy with VC funding can waltz in and get $27 million to do something that other publications have been doing for decades. <laughs> um, it bothers me. Um, so I think there is a bigger connection between Silicon Valley culture, um, Silicon Valley culture's reliance on distributed um, and contracted freelance labor, the hyper-commodification of intellectual property online um, in tech and media, and also that these same institutional structures tend to exclude and have excluded and marginalized people of color, queer trans people, women, disabled people for decades. So all of this has been converging for decades, and now there's a push to try to pull these converges of forces apart to try to create something, um, a, a room for people of people who are marginalized within this space, and I think that's difficult to do. Um, and I wanted to step back a bit because I started to think about how we got this way. To quote my dad, yeah. Um, to go back um, to the advent of online diaries or blogs. Um, in the early 1990s, a lot of the online diaries or blogs that existed uh, were really done as personal um, passion projects by dot-com workers, by students. Um, there was that point within the uh, late 90s and the early 2000s where blogging as a personal platform and medium um, really became something that people did as, as a way to express themselves individually as they did or, um, or got underpaid within the original kind of late 90s dot com. But it also was, I think, uh, a personal extension or individual extension of online communities, Usenet, EBSs that started within the 80s, the 70s and 80s. Um, you move to the early 2000s, you have the rise of uh, live journal, blogger. Um, you had companies really understand the importance of uh, having the actual platforms for people to kind of put their information on. And so a lot of people who were building their own websites, like my first blog, I actually had to build it myself. There were no blog platforms. Um, and now you have actual companies that were building platforms for people to put their, their information on. And, so, and, and it made it easier for people to connect with each other. Um, 
During that time, you saw the rise of political blogs like uh, Daily Coast or uh, Netroots, Huffington Post. Um, you saw the growth of blogging as something that was seen as legitimate by news companies where they didn't see it as that before. If you're old enough to remember the dot-com crash of the early 2000s, um, media companies had pretty much written off um, digital as something that was worth investing in. It was seen as a money journey. Um, blogging was seen as citizen journalism uh, as opposed to actually legitimate journalism. And so a lot of the bloggers from the Web 2.0 era were people who were either doing this right and were still hired as a labor of love, or they were underemployed journalists who were doing it the past the time so they, before they could get a real job. Um, in the mid 2000s, or maybe early like 2004, 2005, you started to see the legitimization of a lot of these blogs. Um, they were seen as legitimate, doing legitimate news reporting and people that could be, to a certain extent, trustworthy within uh, mainstream media. And, but the people that were seen as being legitimized weren't necessarily the people who were doing that personal blogging and tended to be white guys doing political work, even though there were other people doing very similar blogging but not necessarily writing about politics or maybe they were just writing about their own lives. They were all there on the internet, but only certain bloggers were seen as legitimized in doing journalism, while other people were seen as doing, um, were in their parents' basements, uh, in their underwear, just ranking at the world. Um, Alice Marwick is a writer who did a really great book called Status Update um, that gets into a lot of this, and specifically there's a chapter called The Cultural History of Web 2.0. It talks about the different parallel cultural histories that, that created this. Um, 2007, just going back. 2007, um, there was a book called Making Sil Silicon Valley that talks about uh, how pre 1990s, pre 2000, Silicon Valley was really built on um, defense contractors' money and the intellectual capital of universities kind of converging together to create Silicon Valley <coughs> culture, which then in turn started to create hacker uh, ethics and philosophy, this whole idea that information should be free, that people should be able to put their information out into the world and it should be freely accessible and freely to free to consume by everyone. Um, the downside of this is at the same time there was venture capitalists that were investing in these companies and the idea that the free market would decide was basically rising up at the same time as um, the, the hacker culture information should be free. So these are two kind of opposing forces that are merging together to create what we now see as Web 2.0 or post web 2.0 digital media culture. Um, and I think that's, it's it's hard to explain that because it seems like these are two different things that should, should oppose each other, but in Silicon Valley, they kind of came hand in hand. And so you talk about the strength of the free market, but then you also talk about the, the strength of free information and how do you reconcile those two things, uh, especially if you're a publisher or a writer. Um, so, the Web 2.0 culture of Silicon Valley was built on all of these existing kind of competing principles. At the same time, in the 1990s and early 2000s, you had a grassroots print um, and easy scene that the early blogs and message boards were part of it, but um, it was also a lot of print magazines that some of them still exist, many of them don't. Um, and a lot of them did actually focus on the voices of marginalized people, uh, women of color, queers, uh, disabled people, um, just to go down the list. Um, one of them is Hughes, um, which is a publication I still miss today. Um, Makeshift, Bamboo Girl. Bitch is probably the most well known of that kind of uh, a trend of print themes that went digital that spoke to marginalized voices. Um, and for what it's worth, I spent a, a good chunk of my uh, life in the early 2000s writing for a lot of these publications. So I, I, 
I saw the shift from the trying to monetize and um, make money from the uh, from digital media and how they couldn't. It was much harder for them to do that than it was even for them to do print. Um, so you have the explosion of blogger, live journal, um, a lot of these blogging platforms. And so a lot of the writers that would otherwise be writing for these publications eventually just started writing for their own blogs. And so when the mainstream media started to uh, really latch on to white male run political blogs as legitimate blogging, um, even though women and people of color had been there the whole time, it really did start to create this other stratification of who is a legitimate blogger, who can get paid to be a blogger, and who's just a ranter in their parents' basement. Um, not to mention you had online communities that existed the entire time that were geared towards people of color. Black Planet, Asian Avenue, you, the, and tons of people of color who did what they did on Usenet and BBSs. Um, so this idea, this tech utopian, this idea that there would be no race, no gender, no difference online never actually existed. Um, there's always been difference online. There's always been marginalized people and marginalized people creating communities online. And writing for publication online, they just weren't legitimized by the larger mainstream media when the time came to uh, make money off of this. Um, online publications are still struggling to monetize. But right now, um, the way to get funding for this is through venture capital. Um, so now you're seeing a lot of the funding strategies of Silicon Valley moving into uh, to what used to be mainstream media. So you have the bustles of the world and the buzzfeeds of the world that are really getting off the ground through venture capital, even though they still haven't come up with an actual monetization strategy. Um, ad revenue isn't going to be enough to keep them afloat, but it is going to be enough to have two or three years worth of um, content created. Um, but that doesn't help publications like Racial Issues that have existed from the ground up for decades and usually have been a labor of love um, and were created not necessarily with the intent to get venture capital and then to monetize in itself. It was made to um, be a platform for voices who were otherwise um, getting able to, to get an entry point into mainstream publication. Um, but the, industrial, the, the industrialization of creative labor is another kind of more insidious holdover from the early dot-com days. I think now we're seeing that play out um, with these new publications where they're paying people fifty, a hundred dollars to do writing that honestly should take a lot more time, care, editorial curation, um, and respect for the work that people are putting into, you know, basically putting their lives on display for other people's consumption. Um, but the idea of donating your labor, working long hours, and doing a passion project is is a way to basically justify that people would be able to contribute their writing to publications like this. Because it's like, oh, you're doing this for the good of this publication. We're just a startup, so you're donating your labor to us, and you're helping us out while at the same time you're getting exposure. Um, and it's a holdover from the dot-com world, but it's also, I think, a holdover from the indie publishing world. It's like the worst of both Web 2.0 culture and print media culture converging at the same time um, at the expense of trained, talented writers who actually want to do legitimate work for a living wage. Um, and as somebody who participated in all of those scenes for a really long time, to see the connection and the similarities between these scenes converging but not articulating them is something that I've been trying to work through for at least the past couple of years because I think there's a lot there. Um, but it's not really talked about because writers don't want to, to bite the hand at each. You can't talk about bustle and buzzfeed and all of these places uh, without possibly getting yourself in trouble if you ever want to write for one of these publications. Um, and so that's the danger of talking about political economy of media when you are a journalist. Um, it's honestly one of the things that for old school print journalists as their um, as the print media world pretty much collapsed, journalists didn't do a good enough job at the time interrogating what was happening in their own field until it was too late. 
and that is pretty much happening now with, um, with digital media. Uh, at the same time, monetization and funding is really the hardest part, and you can't really interrogate or critique these fields and then still try to look for money. Um, it's really a, a, a scary thing to do if you're interested in trying to build a career for yourself, but you also understand that you're fighting a losing game even as you're trying to fight in this career. Um, there's a lot of great uh, small nonprofit grant programs that are out there, but they really don't pay very much. So you can get a nonprofit grant for $10,000, $15,000, and when the budgets for most digital publications are at least $100,000, if not more, to just get off the ground a year, that $15,000 year grant isn't going to do very much for you. Um, and so I think they're important, but I don't think they're going to move the needle when it comes to the broader issues of media ownership, hiring, having diverse founders in digital media startups. Um, so with that in mind, oh, and then you have um, BuzzFeed has a vertical called Cocoa Butter. Um, which is an example of how you can kind of make some change on the inside if you have an editor. I think there's a, a, a importance of having editors who work in these publications to kind of speak to particular audiences, even while there should be uh, importance given to funding for grassroots projects. Um, I think people are trying to fight the good fight within these structures as much as they can and trying to do more in terms of inclusivity and diversity within digital media, even while they are working in publications that aren't necessarily owned by people of color or by marginalized people. And you've got um, places like Modern Culture that are doing fantastic work um, and trying to create a different model for funding uh, journalism, digital media, and um, publishing. So it's all out there, but I think that there's a, a big fight, a big converging fight, and I think that it's, it's hard to articulate and it's hard to, to explain how to, to make a solution to it. The fight for inclusivity within tech culture in Silicon Valley to me is completely connected and crucial to the fight for inclusivity in media in general. Because at this point, the money's coming from the same place, it's coming from venture capitalists. So now you have all these digital publishing entities that are making an effort towards inclusivity, but it's much harder to fight that exploitation of writers and creative people um, and the fact that that exploitation tends to dis disproportionately affect those who are marginalized. The people who are most likely to not be staff writers, most likely to get paid those 50 to $100 a pop pieces, um, tend to be people of color. They're not going to get hired to be staff writers, but they're definitely going to get hired to write those great page view, um, getting hot takes on a particular issue. How do we move the needle so that more marginalized people are moving into positions of power and influence and getting funded for their own projects as opposed to just having to fight for representation within existing large-scale projects. Um, the projects that get um, funding and support tend to be working through the same networks. They're not grassroots and independent projects. And so in order for there to be true diversity in media, there's got to be room for both large-scale projects and fully funded grassroots and independent projects. Um, you can fight to have a place at the table, but if the food is only going around to one half of the table and the rest of the people on the other half of the people, of people are starving, having a place at the table doesn't really matter as much. So there's got to be a, a discussion about where the money is going, where the funding is going, who gets the money, and how and why what needs to be done. Um, and a clear interrogation of the social and economic factors that have created this digital media economy and the earlier digital media economies that existed before it and the difficulties of monetization and how that is more so if you're a person of, of color or a marginalized person in the media. And without really interrogating that, all the talks about diversity in media and representation in media, you're only going to hit a wall. And it's just going to be like, how many black people, how many queer people, how many disabled people can you plug into this? But still, there's not enough people to actually have ability to, to create new publications, to hire an entire staff 
of, of diverse writers and to fight for topics that maybe mainstream publications would not see as saleable or page um, How do we move that needle? I don't know. <laughs> I honestly, like, I, I've been thinking about it. I was up last night thinking about what needs to be done to move that needle, and the only thing I can think of at this point is that the more that we can see how crucially connected Silicon Valley culture and media culture is right now, not just on a, you know, oh, everything's digital now, it's really fun, um, but just on a funding and infrastructure level, if we can see that the media industry now is pretty much an echo of Silicon Valley culture. Um, and if we can start to make those connections, then maybe some of the, the fights for inclusion and diversity within Silicon Valley can now be used as a, a way to fight for inclusion and diversity in media. And maybe there can be some cross-pollination with strategies between these two worlds and, and see them as being connected as opposed to um, side by side. Um, so that's it for me. Thanks for listening. <laughs> I'll try to answer it because I'm, I'm still doing a lot of research on this. So. Uh, so you talked a little bit about uh, grants. Um, yeah. Have you done any research on like Patreon or similar kind of like crowdfunding systems? Yeah, and I think Patreon is great. Um, I think that it's, oh, sorry, you know, talking about other funding, like crowdfunding sources um, and all that. To me, Patreon is still connected, again, to the Silicon Valley.com ethos. Like, that's still, they're still connected. So I don't necessarily see it. It's, it's another option, but I don't necessarily see it as something that is, is kind of scalable um, on a broader level because it's still kind of based on that distributed economic idea that people with little bits of money can give as much as they can until they don't have any money. But at a certain point, how does it, you know, how do we create something where there's funding that can actually scale up as opposed to it always being like little bits of money coming from the bottom to the top as opposed, and then like, and it's usually for, again, marginalized people as opposed to those who already have connections to venture capital can just basically go in and get funding for at least three years worth of uh, a solvent company. So it's just the model, the, the models need to be kind of carried as much as humanly possible, um, which is hard to do. But I, I, I like the trend, I just, my blog's not the trend. I get a little bit of money, but you can't, you know, there's so much hustle with that, and you can't really do that unless that's uh, your job, or you have somebody else doing that job for you. So there's got to be another way, especially when you have different companies who are you know, basically walking in with them. Are there any uh, platforms that you think are really important for people to
Um, and it's a nonprofit. And if you look at grants, but that's still going to be for six months. Another. So, and advertising isn't necessarily going to be the thing to see that publication as well. So, um, I don't know. I think just looking at different models um, and being open about what those models are, it's hard to do. But I think the more that um, we can see publications kind of revealing that, opening the curtain a little bit, and saying, this is how we make our money um, for good or ill, I think it will be helpful. Um, we're here are the, the networks that we run in to get this little bit of funding, because usually they're not going to be uh, scholarships or uh, fellowships. They, even that is like, the public fellowships are not the way that people make money to survive. They're just a little stuff that. Thank you.